Well, we're continuing with the great therefore section of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Christian church that was in Rome. Uh, This therefore section started in chapter 12 after we took uh, a look at 11 chapters of all that God has done for us and how he has taken those of us, which is all of us, who do not deserve and have no ability on our own to make ourselves right with God, how he has done that for us. And then suddenly it shifts to therefore, this is what we ought to do, not to earn God's favor, but because we have already got God's favor. And if we've stepped over the line to become a follower of Jesus Christ, we are already sons and daughters of the King Most High. And now he's telling us how to live like it. And we've been marching through a a series of very practical life uh, instructions. A couple of weeks ago, Chris Brown did an overview of all of them. Then last weekend, I came back and took a look at uh, what it means to to hate evil and cling to that which is, is good. And now today, we're going to come to a couple of other verses after that. So if you don't already have your Bible open to it, uh, find Romans chapter 12. And we're going to look together at verses 10, 11, and 12. Three simple verses as we uh, dig into uh, the various trees that are in this forest of 24 instructions, uh, how we are to live as the new you, the new me, the new us, sons and daughters of the Most uh, High. Now, Chris talked about it uh, at the beginning of this. He had talked about it in a message before that. I had talked about it. I'm going to circle back, or Chris is, in the next few weeks. We're going to see over and over and over this one concept. And that is that we are now called to have a right relationship with God and a right relationship with other people. It's the idea that we are to love God and we are to love others, the two sides of the coin of what it means in its most basic and most simple form to be a Jesus follower. Now, the reason I think that Paul says this over and over and over in the book of Romans is a couple of things. As I've already pointed out uh, in the last few weeks, uh, this is a, a book that was designed to be read, and so you come back over and over to things. It's not one that you marked up and you studied because, again, Gutenberg hadn't shown up yet. People didn't have a Bible by their nightstand. Uh, you had to kind of listen to it. So uh, repetition, 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 just like a parent does, a boss does, any leader does. The Apostle Paul keeps coming back at this. Now, what we're doing throughout this series, though, when we come back to it, is we're not looking at every aspect of what it means to love God or every aspect of what it means to love one another. We're treating them almost like diamonds where we look at different facets of it, and we have the ability these days to stop and go, wow, not only what did uh, the Scripture say there, but what do the rest of Scripture say about this uh, same thing as well? And that's what we're going to be doing again today. Now, what I'd like you to jot down on your note sheet, there's a little place for it, is that loving God always involves loving others. That's what we've been hearing. That's what we're going to continue to hear. Loving God always involves loving others. There uh, was a a period of history where uh, a monastic uh, period where where people thought, well, you know what, if I'm going to love God with everything I have, the the main thing I ought to do is I ought to get away from every distraction that takes my focus away from God. And so they would go and and live in in monasteries or they'd live in caves. And the idea was you were somehow more devoted and and, and fervent after God if uh, somehow you had no other uh, uh, touch with uh, humanity. And yet there, there, nothing could be further from the truth because he, he didn't call us just to have a relationship with him. He, he could have taken us home if that was the plan. He called us when he left to represent him to the world, to uh, uh, live together as brothers and sisters in Christ and to love the world out there in a way that persuades them to also come and join the family just like we have. So loving God always involves loving others. I've got a series of verses just real quickly there for you. Matthew 22, 36 to 40 is on your note sheet. That's the passage we've looked at recently where a lawyer, a scribe, a scholar came to Jesus and said, uh, hey, what's the greatest commandment? And he, he quoted the Old Testament, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then he said, also to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you can see I've got down there Romans 13.10 that we're going to come to in a little bit, where we are told that love is the fulfillment of God's law. 
Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verses 9 and 10 has a unique thing to it. It says not only are we to love others, but there's supposed to be a unique love that we have towards one another. Uh, Listen to these words from Galatians 6, 9 to 10. Let us uh, not become weary in doing good, and he's talking about towards one another, for at the proper time we're going to reap a harvest if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, now catch this, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. John 13, 34 to 35, if you write real small in your note sheet, you might write next to that verse this simple phrase, it's a proof that we are genuine Jesus followers. That's how important it is. He says, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples or my followers, if you love one another. And then 1 John 4, 20 to 21, if anyone claims to love God but hates his brother, the truth is not in him, that anyone who loves God must love others. So there you have it. I've pounded that hammer all the way down, uh, that nail with a hammer all the way down into the, into the wood, but it's important for us to grasp. And, and here's what we're going to do now. We're going to take a look at the passage, Romans 12, verses 10, 11, and 12, and then we're going to spend some time talking about how does this work out in real life. He starts out with a side of the coin that is putting others first. Verse 10, <clears throat> be devoted to one another in love. And here's how you do that. You honor one another above yourselves. And then he flips to the spiritual zeal side. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. And here's how you do it. You be joyful in hope, you be patient in affliction, and you be faithful in prayer. Now, a couple of things I I want you to note that we're going to circle back and look at later. And the the first one is in verse 11. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. And then he says what not lacking in zeal and having spiritual uh, fervor looks like. You might want to underline serving the Lord. That will become important later. Don't lack in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor, a word for boiling over, uh, a a word for seething with fervor. But then he says, here's what it looks like. It looks like serving the Lord. And then he gives some practical applications, this idea of being joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer that we're going to look at later. But now let's step back and and take a look in a very practical way uh, that that works uh, day in and day out in our neighborhoods, our families, and our, our workplace What does it really mean to be devoted to brotherly love or to love and to honor one another as more important than ourselves? So here's some things that might help us figure out what that's supposed to look like and overcome some of the natural resistance that we were born with, with our sin nature that always puts us at the center of the universe. The first one is this. It starts with a decision. If I'm going to be a person who's devoted to love and honors one another, then I am going to have to start with the idea that I'm making a decision. Just think think about that word, be devoted to. Do we ever need to tell someone to be devoted to things they love to do, right? Do do any of you need to be instructed, uh, be devoted to sweets and desserts? (laughs) Any of you need that instruction? Okay. Because if so, you can come meet me afterward, because I've obviously been well-trained in that. Uh, How about be devoted to sleep? No. See, the very command, be devoted, carries a couple things uh, in it that we need to note. And number one, he's asking us to do something that does not come naturally. It doesn't come naturally if you're a non-Christian. It doesn't come naturally if you're a new Christian. It doesn't come naturally if you're at the front of the follow Jesus line as the best Christian ever. It's not how we naturally behave. That's why he says be devoted. And there's a second thing about this idea of being devoted that's pretty important. And it is this. Whenever there's a command, it means there's a choice. Whenever there's a command, it means there's a choice. We can choose to do it or not. 
And if we can choose to do it, that gets rid of all the natural excuses that are, are so quick to come to all of our lives. Uh, you know, the things in my head and your head that would say, well, normally I'll do that, but I don't want to do it in this case. Or, or well, you know what, that, that works out, but not to this group of people or, 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 or this one or at this time or this place. All those excuses go away when we understand, no, he fully grasps. It's not something that comes natural. It's not something we would want to do to one another, to our, our spouses, to our parents, to our kids, to our coworkers, to our neighbor or anybody. But he also says, you can do it. That's why I gave you a command. Because if it's a command, it's a choice. And when we don't do it, it's not because we can't do it. It's because always we don't want to do it. Now, on your note sheet, I have uh, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21 written down. In fact, go ahead and, and take a look at it. I'd like you to see this one. Uh, it, it's to the right in your Bible from Romans. It's another little letter uh, from the Apostle Paul. It was written to a church in a town called Galatia. Galatians chapter 5, 19 to 21. One of many what are called epistles or letters by the Apostle Paul. He wrote a ton of them to various churches. And in this section that we're looking at, he's contrasting what happens when we have yielded ourselves to the Holy Spirit. Remember, when we step over the line and become a follower of Jesus, he forgives our sins, he adopts us into his family, and then he sends the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out. So he go, he's saying, this is what life is like when you have a group of believers who, who let the Holy Spirit uh, guide them. It's called the fruit of the Spirit, which by the way, if you're a longtime Christian, it's not that any one individual has all of these things at all of the time. It's that you can tell a group of people are led by the Spirit of God being changed into who He's made them to be if, if love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and the series of things called the fruit of the Spirit are there. But he also says, let me tell you how you can know that they're waving the banner of being a Christian but they're no more a Christian than the man in the moon. You can know this because the flesh is operating and not the spirit, it's what's controlling them. And now here's what's fascinating to me about the fruit of the flesh. He names 18, uh, excuse me, 15 things on this list. The acts of the flesh, when we're just letting our life control us, are obvious. Among a group of people who just live to their own compass, here's what you're going to find. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. Now catch this. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. Drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now here's what I want you to catch. There's 15 things on this list of what a group of people, not controlled by the Spirit, but just controlled by their own desires, what they do and how they live. And of those 15, over half of them deal with how we get along with one another. Did you catch that? Eight of the 15 have to do with honoring one another, putting others as more important than ourselves, getting along, loving others as we love God. Let me give them to you again real quickly. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy. They are all about this relationship, are they not? That's how important it is. And that's why he says be devoted. It's not what comes naturally when the flesh takes over. We so often think when the flesh takes over, it's all this debauchery. Yeah, that's included, <laughs> but it's much more... Uh, we just can't get along. We just can't play well in the sandbox. Now, here's the second thing. If we're going to be devoted to love, and the Greek word there is brotherly love, Philadelphia, okay, a, a family. If we're going to be devoted to that, and we're going to honor one another above ourselves, it not only is going to start with a decision, but second, real honoring has a real cost. If I'm really going to honor you above myself, there's a real cost to that. It's not just, you know, leaving the ball game and deciding I'm going to let two cars sneak into the line ahead of me, you know, or, or leaving North Coast uh, Vista Campus and letting somebody, you know, sneak out in front of you or whatever you're waiting. It's like, oh, good, good. 
Okay, but 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 those things are are are, are little symbols. They're just they're, they're they're opportunities for us to practice putting others first. But they're not what he's talking about. Putting others first, if we're really going to do it, has a real cost, and that's why we have to be devoted to it. Because I'll put my spouse first, and so will you, as long as it works to your good. But there comes a time after a while where I go, Nancy, I'm losing too much here. Well, if you want the truth, it's the other way around, but I don't want to go there. (laughs) Uh, Right? I I, I mean, we're all willing to put others first until we get too far behind on the scoreboard. That's why it says devoted, and that's what we've got to understand. Putting others first is not just social kindness. It's really putting them first at real cost. I was thinking about this this uh, week, and, and, and it hit me. Probably um, the, the first story that comes to my mind of, of putting others first is, uh, is a story from the Old Testament and a, and a story from Jesus. The story from the Old Testament is the one I looked at last weekend when I talked about Abraham and Lot and how Abraham, the patriarch, who had the choice of whatever land he wanted when they need to, needed to split, stepped back and he said, no, Lot, you get first choice. You pick what you want. What an amazing, amazing step. The one of Jesus is when he washed his apostles' feet. That he, he took a, a basin and a towel, and because no one else had done it when they had gathered together for their, their last time together, uh, he took the role of the lowest servant, and he washed their feet. It's a rather famous story. And I've always thought of that as, that's the quintessential. That's what, that's what honoring others is. It's all about taking the lowest role and helping them out. But think with me. After you and I do the washing of feet, for somebody in the neighborhood, the workplace, our spouses or whatever, it's a little bit of a step. But does it have any impact 20 minutes later? Talk to me. No. And here's what hit me. When Jesus washed their feet, it wasn't the ultimate example of putting others first. It was the primer It was that little ABC lesson of what it means to put others first. It was at its lowest level. And I want to show you how that works out. Find in your New Testament a book called Philippians. It's still to the right of Galatians, just a few pages if you're there. And there's a little letter to the church in Philippi. And it's here we find out what the real cost of putting others first is. Washing feet's a good example that's like preschool. That's like kindergarten, first grade stuff. You know, we're, we're, we're learning the alphabet, you know. See Jesus, see Jesus run, see Jesus, see Jesus wash feet. You know, get a little bowl, do, you know, and, and find the proverbial ways to do I, Which, by the way, I'm not putting that, that's wonderful. But that was the primer. Here's what putting others first actually means. One of my favorite passages is Philippians 2, 3 through 11, especially verses 3 to 5, and that's where I'm starting. Chapter 2, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit. Or the new NIV says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of others. In your relationship with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. So do nothing else out of selfishness or empty conceit. Put the needs of others, uh, interests of others first. And in fact, when you do that, make sure you have the same mindset that, that you look at it the same way Jesus did. And now he tells us. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Literally in the Greek, something to be grasped or held onto. It's talking about his incarnation, his birth as his baby, of, as a baby, his living as a man. And here's what he says. Verse 7, rather he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a what? Talk to me. Cross. Now catch this. Verse 9. Therefore, because of that, 
God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Do you see what this passage says? The ultimate example of honoring others is not washing their feet. It's not letting them be first in line. It's not all of those things that are good steps towards it. No, the ultimate example of Jesus Christ, the mind that we are supposed to have, is so costly that he was willing to die for you and for me. Be devoted to brotherly love. Honor one another as more important than yourself. It's not the little stuff. It's the stuff that drives us crazy. It's the stuff that messes with your marriage because you're so far behind. It's the stuff that works, messes with your workplace. It's the stuff that messes with all kinds of life because we go, okay, I've gone far enough. And the example of Jesus is, no. Dude, you got first grade. You've got the primer. And that's why it's a command. Be devoted. Work hard at it. It's not easy. It's not natural. Because in the real deal, it has real cost. So what does it look like day to day? Well, I think one of the most obvious things, just to, if you want to jot something down, you can, but just kind of off the top of my head, one of the most obvious things is you don't always get your way. You don't always get your way. We were talking in our sermon prep meeting where we kind of look ahead and stuff about, about some of the places in life where we, we honor people, not because they're better, but because we're taking on that role of giving them honor. Uh, any of you ever been to a, a wedding? Just help me out here in, in venues and, and things, right? You ever been to a, vi- a wedding you didn't want to go to? Okay. Now, how many of you came into that wedding and let everybody know you didn't want to go to it? Have any of you been at, at, at the dinner afterward and, be, and been served something you didn't like? Okay? Did any of you like, like, you know, make a big deal out of that? I mean, I hope not. I mean, everything in our social understanding says, you know what, today is not about me. And I really wish I was doing something else than wait here for four hours while they take the pictures after the ceremony. Sorry, that was just thrown in there. But it's their day. And I really wish they would have served something else, but it's whose day? It's their day. You know, I really don't like that song or that music, but it's whose day? It's their day. And only the biggest idiot in the world would speak up about any of those things outside of to their spouse on the way home as you critique it. (laughs) And that's another issue we'll deal with in another sermon. You see, in these kind of settings, we just step back and go, ah, whatever. And what Jesus is telling us to do in this passage is that should be the way we live our life. That should be the way we do our marriage. That should be the way we do our friendships. That should be the way we do our workplace. Ah, whatever. I wonder how many of you worked in retail or waiting tables. Help me out with that one, okay? You know, when I was in retail, um, uh, you know, the customer is always what? No, they're not. They're wrong. They're idiots. (laughs) But we pretend the customer is always what? Right. Or those of you waiting on tables, man, uh, you know, you just, you, you, you come up and you got all this stuff, and, and they, they just act like you're not even there, right? It's like, ah, uh, excuse me, my arm's about to fall off, you know, whatever. And, and, and what do you do? Do you chew them out? No, you just go, whatever. You might spit in their coffee, but whatever. <laughs> no, no, you wouldn't And in a sense, what we do for a tip, what we do for a boss, what we do for a company, what we do at a wedding, or what we do at a birthday party, that's all Jesus is asking us to do for him. And he's given us far more than a paycheck. That's all he's asking. But I haven't honored others if all I do is uh, whatever on the things I don't care about. I only start to honor you when I care about it. Does that make sense? It starts with a decision. Real honoring has real cost. 
And third, this is just the truth about how it works. The more insecure I am, the harder it becomes to honor others. That's part of why understanding our identity in Christ as sons and daughters of the King, and not only who we are, but who we're going to become, is so important. Because the more secure we are, the easier it is to take on that role. The more insecure we are, the harder it is. Everything becomes an issue. If I'm waiting in line, and a seven-year-old steps in front of me, I roll my eyes, I look at Nancy, and I go, whatever, punk kid. But it's really weird. If somebody my own age just pushes me aside and jumps in, I have a totally different visceral reaction. Are you the same way? What's the only difference? What if I was a kid? And so I don't particularly feel challenged by that. Good, you're getting cake. You can't even drive home for seven more years, you know. <laughs> and the other is like, who do you think you are? Same thing happens to completely different responses. Because in one I'm secure and the other I'm insecure. The more you and I in our marriages, our workplace, our friendships, in every part of life can understand who Jesus has made us into and all that we are going to become, the easier it is to take on that role of service. And the more insecure we are in it, the harder it is. I mentioned earlier the passage of Scripture where Jesus does the primer on what it means to put others first, this idea of, of washing feet. It's, found in, it's on your note sheet here under this point, John chapter 13, verses 3 to 5. And I'm always fascinated by the Apostle John as he's telling this story, how he doesn't just tell us what Jesus did, but he tells us what was going on in Jesus' mind. Listen to these words. Jesus, knowing that the Father had put all things under his power. <laughs> okay. If you knew you had all the, you know, you, you, you are God, but you did not regard that equality with God, something to be grasped. You took on the form of man. You're living out as a real man, setting it aside. But you know that the Father has still given you all power in the universe. Just a little question. Do you think you might be a little bit secure? Just a, just a little bit, right? So there's what he says. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power. Here's what he also knew, that he had come from God and he was returning to God. So he got up for the meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that poured water in a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet. John understands how difficult it is to really take on this role. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, rather than just telling us a story, he says, no, 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 no. Before you know what Jesus did, you need to know what Jesus was thinking. Security or insecurity is a huge part of our ability to serve or not serve others well. And here's the fourth thing about honoring others. Not only is it totally unnatural, not only does it flow out of security, and not only does it have a real cost, but the reward for honoring others comes later. It would be easy to honor others if you got a standing O for doing it. It would be easy to honor others if every time you did, they said, you know, thank you so much. I so don't deserve what you just did for me. But that's not what they do, is it? And the reward is later. And on your note sheet, you might even write, write this. You might write, much later. <laughs> um, I was just finishing up a, 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 a book that uh, it, it's, it's called Lead Like a Shepherd, and it takes a look at uh, the 23rd Psalm, how the Lord is our shepherd, and a, and a, a passage in 1 Peter chapter 5 where he tells uh, uh, leaders to shepherd the flock among them and how to do it. And then he says this at the end of it, and it really, as I was taking the deep dive working on this book, I saw something I'd never seen before. He says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive your crown of glory. 
okay. Yeah, man, if you're a leader or any part of Christianity, in this place he was talking about leaders, do what God says and you'll get your reward. Yeah, it's, it's later. It's not right now. And then I thought, when the who? Chief who? Shepherd, when he does what? Appears. Guess what? That hasn't happened yet. Peter wasn't just saying, hey, do all this stuff and you'll get a great reward. Just wait. Peter was saying, you'll get a great reward and just wait. Peter's been waiting over 2,000 years. (laughs) And he doesn't know how much longer. Now, there are some rewards in the short run when we do the right thing. Absolutely, there are. And, 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 you know, my natural thought was, you know what, I'm, I'm rewarded when I die and I stand in the presence of the Lord. No, 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 no. That even is our hors d'oeuvres. The whole sense of our reward for the sacrifices that we make, according to Peter, we get that crown, not when we get to heaven, when who returns? Jesus returns. And I got to thinking about that. I go, oh, yeah. Because when you read the book of Revelation, which, you know, there's much of it I don't understand. You're always asking Chris and me if we'll teach through it, and we will whenever we understand it. (laughs) Once we know who the Antichrist is, we will let you know within 24 hours. (laughs) Okay? But there are some things I know in it, and, and one of those things I know is this. That when the time comes for Jesus to return, we're told the angels shout for joy and those who are already in heaven are geeked up, thrilled, and ecstatic, and they say, finally, the time has come. See, they're still waiting too. That's why this devoted to loving others, especially the household of God, And honoring others is more important than ourselves is really easy to say. But I want to tell you, Thursday at 3 p.m., it is really hard to do. And these are the things we need to understand about it. It's got real cost. And it will have some rewards in the short run. But the real reward is much later. I mean, think with me about the short run, just a couple of them for a minute or two. Uh, I mean, God never tells us to do things just because he wants us to do things. They're always for our benefit. Even the things we most go, God, why can't I do that? It's always for our benefit. (laughs) The Father always knows best. You know, in psychology, pretty much every study of happiness shows that those who spend their life watching out for themselves are incredibly happy. Not. Right? Right? Every study on happiness shows that the more somebody is dialed in to make sure they're not taken advantage of, the less happy they are. Or in the workplace. I'm sure you've noticed that those who make sure nobody takes an advantage of them and they never work a minute longer than they were supposed to or help anybody else that's not in their little sphere, those people get promoted left and right. Of course not. And in marriage. Yeah, watching out for number one, that's a great way to have three or four of them. (laughs) Right? Because like all of the things of the flesh, they make sense in the short run, but they're incredibly destructive in the long run. Now let's talk for a few moments about the other side of the coin, maintaining spiritual zeal. (coughs) Back to verse 11 in Romans. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor. And then I had you underline, serving the Lord. Here's what I'd like you to write down under maintaining our spiritual zeal. Zeal doesn't always show up in our emotions. It always shows up in our actions. The passage actually uses a word for boiling over a seething, uh, seething sense of fervent zeal for the Lord, but what we often think is that's an emotional phrase, and the Bible is not usually as emotive as we tend to think it is. 
because of uh, some little twist of language. The ultimate proof of spiritual zeal is shown in serving the Lord, not in how excited you get. That's why I had general like that. The ultimate proof of serving the Lord is shown, uh, excuse me, of zeal is shown in serving the Lord, not how motive I am or am not. Some of us are incredibly emotive. You watch, watch a Padre game, they get up by two runs, you start crying for joy. <laughs> Others of us, uh, like, you know, your favorite team in the playoff to win the championship does something, and we go, hmm, yeah. We're all over the map. And we are that way in our, our relationships with people, our, our spiritual, you know, it's, it's kind of a disposition we're born with. But all of us are called to be zealous for the Lord. But that doesn't mean a motive. That means obedient. That means dialed in. When Jesus was asked, what's the great commandment? He started with the God side. To love the Lord your God with all your, and some of you remember, all your what? Heart. Now, in the English language, when I say I heart you, uh, I love you, whatever, when we speak of the heart, that is the seat of emotions in the English language. Would you agree with me? Well, here's the problem. In the Greek language, the seat of emotions is not your heart. It's actually got a much better phrase. It's your gut. Greek word is splagna. Okay? And, and, and basically, uh, when it talks about emotions, it talks about like the bowels of compassion, if you ever heard an old Shakespearean King James Bible. And, and when you think about it, it, it's more accurate, right? Because what happens when you get bad news? Your stomach churns, right? Uh, if you're all stressed out, you're going to have stomach problems. You might have heart problems, but st- right? And, and, and so, in, in a biblical concept, when it talks about our heart, it's actually talking about our will. The mind was the thought, the heart was the conviction, and the gut was the emotions. So, when he says be fervent, and when he says don't let your zeal lag, he's telling us in modern day language keep after it no matter what. Keep it as your first priority. In your deepest will, be dialed in. Be all there. And he doesn't really care a whole lot whether you're real emotive or not emotive with that because that's not what the heart spoke of. And that's why when he says, be fervent, maintain your zeal, that he said, here's what it looks like. It looks like serving the Lord. Never lack in zeal. Keep your fervor. Just serve the Lord. (laughs) Last weekend we took a look at uh, Micah 6, 8. What does God require of us? If I'm going to be zealous, my heart is sold out to God. My will is, what am I going to do? Well, what's he require us? Well, we saw to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. So I'm going to be fervent and zealous towards that. I've got in your note sheet James 1, 27. True religion in in God's eyes is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep ourselves from being polluted by the world. Helping the needy. It's the justice piece. Walking humbly before God. It's the purity piece. That's what spiritual zeal looks like. Now, my bet is a lot of you have bought into some of the things that early on in my Christian life, here's what I thought spiritual zeal looked like. Spiritual zeal looked like the person who was unable to sit down in a restaurant without witnessing to the waiter and two tables over. They were zealous for God. Spiritual zeal looked like somebody who always wanted to sing one more song and read three more Bible verses. They were zealous. Spiritual zeal looked like somebody who really got into worship big time emotively and physically. Now, there might or might not be something wrong or good about any of those things. But as we've seen, they are not what it means to make sure we don't lack in zeal and to make sure we maintain our spiritual fervor. By the way, a little sidebar here to parents. Sometimes I do a talk uh, on, uh, call it the six gifts for your kids. And uh, it has to do with some of the things to keep in mind when you raise kids. And here's a very important thing for those of you that are trying to raise your children in the Lord. 
Don't confuse their embarrassment at zeal with embarrassment about God. Don't confuse the fact that they are embarrassed by your spiritual zeal at time with the idea that they are embarrassed by God. Let me explain what I mean. Kids are embarrassed by any show of zeal by their parents. First of all, with every kid, there's just one little window or huge window where they're just as embarrassed as all get out that you are their parents. <laughs> right? And it's part of the learning to be independent. And all. I mean, it is unavoidable. In the best of households, in the most loving relationship, there's going to be this window. The only question is how long it lasts where whatever it is you do, I'm in ministry, professional, vocational ministry, and I'll talk with other pastors, and they'll talk about how their kids are embarrassed by the job they have. And I go, dude, it's not that. You're misreading it. Kids are just embarrassed by parents. You know, they'd be embarrassed that you're a plumber. They'd be embarrassed that you're a real estate agent. They're, they're, they're embarrassed that you're a human being in a life. <laughs> and so the same thing happens with zeal. That some of us, you know, we have these little things we do in our zeal for the Lord that are expressions of who we are. And maybe you're uh, extroverted and you're quick to talk to strangers and engage in conversations and, and pray and hope that it turns to some spiritual thing. That it might go somewhere uh, deep or it might just be a little seed that you're planting. Uh, some of you uh, are uh, very zealous for certain disciplines and behaviors. Or you're, you're very dialed in, you go to a restaurant and you want to make sure, you know, we need to always be thanking God for that. And, and I want to tell you, that's all fine and good, but when you have kids in that age, sublimate your expressions of zeal so that you don't embarrass them. Because it's not a spiritual thing that's going on, it's a growing up thing that's going on. Does that make sense? I mean, it works this way. If I'm, if I'm really zealous about politics, whether the right or left, and everybody I'm around, I get into a discussion on, guess what? My kids are going to hate politics, or they're going to certainly grow up and vote for the party I don't vote for. <laughs> uh, I grew up a USC football fan. If uh, uh, wh what I have is uh, I, I, I have a license plate for USC, I have four or five bumper stickers. Uh, when, you, when I honk the horn, it plays the USC fight on song. <laughs> Uh, I'm always ragging on UCLA. Guess where my kids are going to go to school? <laughs> UCLA. Right. See, it's the, it's the zeal. This, just a real practical thing. I like to always, it's not long if you've been around me, but I, I like to always thank God for his blessings because every good and perfect gift comes down from him. And one of the things is to thank him for the food. I don't bless it because I've tried that. It still doesn't turn into steak. It's whatever it is, good, bad, or ugly. <laughs> but I thank him for it. Well, there came a time uh, with our kids where when you would pray in a restaurant, you know, there was a time where let's all pray, that's cute. And then there was suddenly a time like, Dad, you're embarrassing the snot out of me. So what do you do? Well, you pray with your eyes open. And when the waiter or waitress walks up, you stop and you talk to them just like you would stop talking to somebody else. And you get, like, there's no reason to make the confusion of zeal and the resistance of zeal that they have as a resistance of spiritual things. You with me on that? I think it will help. You know, a lot of your parents need more spiritual zeal. And you need more of those kind of disciplines. But some of you are hyper dog and really on fire for God. God bless you, keep at it, be you. But understand in that little window of time that some of, you think, some of the things you think are honoring Jesus are driving your kids away from Jesus. Understand the difference. Because fervor and zeal is not how crazy I am for God. It's how deep in the heart and the will I'm committed to serving God. That's what it is. A couple of other things real quickly. We, we get what we pursue when it comes to maintaining our spiritual zeal. The treasures we seek become the treasures that own us. <laughs> That's why Jesus said, be careful where you lay, uh, lay up your treasures, because the things that I pursue the most are the things that become most valuable to me, because I spent the, the most time, energy, and most of my life doing it. If God's agenda is my top priority, I'm ma maintaining my fervor and zeal in serving Him, I will get His agenda I will get his blessings, and I will get everything else thrown in. But if I let my zeal and fervor fade away, and I begin to dial in and be zealous and fervent 
for my career, for finances, for my favorite hobby, for whatever. If other things besides the kingdom become the fervor and zeal of my life, guess what will probably happen? I will probably get what I'm pursuing. But it will come with a tragic thing called destination sickness. What's destination sickness? It's when we get everything we ever wanted and find out we didn't want it. And some of you have been there with some things in your life. It's not wrong to dream and pursue other things. It's just that there's only one thing worth our fervor and worth our zeal. And that's the things of our Lord. And then he says at the end of it that when life gets tough... We need to choose hope, patience, and prayer. Because nothing drains zeal like a trial. Just like nothing drains your energy physically and emotionally like stress. And it's pretty normative for Christians to go through trials. We should not be surprised by them. And that's why he says be fervent, be zealous. And he says... Keep completely after it, serving the Lord, and here's how you do it. When you feel like it's fading away, he says, man, hold on to hope. Be joyful in your hope. When there's nothing to be happy about in your circumstances today, here's what you still have. You have hope, and biblically, hope isn't, oh, I hope, I hope, I wish, I wish. No, it's confidence. Jesus is our blessed hope. It's not, oh, I kind of hope he comes back. It's I know he comes back. And he says, so when all hell's breaking loose, you want to know how to maintain your zeal and your fervor? Don't let your trials rob you of your joy. Stay joyful in the hope of what you know. And then he says, just endure another day. Be patient in your afflictions. It's just to remain under. He says, if you understand where it's going, then you can just dig in and stay there a little longer. There are so many things in life that are incredibly hard and uncomfortable, but we go through willingly because we know there's something on the other side. Every one of you moms that went through natural childbirth, that was a great joy, right? But you endured it for the joy set before you. Those of you who want to be a Marine, boot camp, that was fun. No, you endured it for the joy set before you. The mom doesn't just get up and run out, she can't. The Marine doesn't just get up and run away, he can't. He's already committed, she's already committed, it's it's happening. But those who understand the process remain patient because they know the joy of their hope. And then in the midst of it, he says the one thing you never wanna stop doing He says, never stop praying. That's all be faithful in prayer means. If we're faithful in something, we keep at it. There's a verse in uh, the, uh, it's it's on your note sheet, 1 Thessalonians, uh, what is it, chapter 5, verse 17. The old King James says, pray without ceasing. Some of us uh, grew up thinking that meant you're supposed to be praying all the time or always in a, no, no. All that means is don't give up. It doesn't mean you're praying 24-7. I mean, that's like, you got a problem. You're weird. He says, don't cease. Keep at it. And that's what will help you see the joy and the hope and the end of the patience in the affliction. Two sides of the coin. Honor one another and stay fervent and zealous towards his agenda. That's the new you. That's the new me. That's the new us. Father, help us with the power of your spirit and the instruction of your word to be the men and women you've already made us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. And as you go, I hope and pray we go with a commitment to be as fervent and as zealous as we possibly can for the things of the Lord. And we understand 
that one of the ways that we most serve him is when we honor others as more important than ourselves. Loving God always involves loving others. So, turn around and greet somebody that's heart easy to love. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. God bless. <laughs>